This conference will now be recorded. Sylvia. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day, this time together. Dear Lord, we are so thankful to be able to come into your presence, to study your word, to be assisted by the Holy Spirit to see the truth and apply it to our lives as, as we lift up any place in our lives that is sinful against you. We, we turn away from it and we turn toward you. We, we repent of any areas that need to be cleaned up in our lives. And we know that as we simply choose to repent, that you are faithful to forgive us and open the channels of effective prayer. We are so thankful, Father, uh, for your Holy Spirit helping us to be more committed to Christ every day. Uh, don't let anything come between you and and us dear lord uh put your hand of protection around us your hand of healing on us your hand of provision uh on us and uh open our hearts and our minds to your word lord we ask that we constantly grow in the lord father um we seek your guidance on where we can find extra time to spend uh studying your wisdom and your word and that uh, you will honor it because blessing always follows obedience you will honor our commitment to finding more time for you father we we ask that you give us opportunities to speak your truth and love to a very dark world lord uh we know that uh we don't have to convince anything of anyone all we need to do is be willing to share what you have done in our lives. And it is indeed miraculous. Anytime anyone is saved, it's a miracle. Yes. Father, we ask that um, you help us to be unafraid to obey in the face right. of a very increasingly hostile world. A world uh, in this country especially, and, and this country was founded on, on biblical principles, on the Mosaic law and on, on freedom of religion, not freedom from religion, which is how it's being twisted now. Father, open the eyes and the hearts of the people around us with your light reflecting off us from our Lord and Savior. Lord, uh, help us to be ready to share whenever you give us opportunities and being share sharing with people uh whatever it is if it's something physical if it's food if it's shelter if it's clothing or if it's the word of god you know that little boy with the five fishes and the two loaves uh he had an opportunity there and we're still talking about it today so you can use it for your kingdom purposes use all of our efforts for your kingdom purposes not for our own glory, but for thine. We're so thankful for Rob that he is completely going to be cancer free, no leukemia, no skin cancers. And Father, you have done an amazing healing in his life over the 15 years that we have been married. We're so thankful for it. And we lift up all the other prayer requests that have been tendered here tonight. Father, uh, we praise you for healing uh, elderly folks with COVID, and especially my, my mom, Marianne, who's 92, is completely fever-free and on the other side of corona coronavirus. So thankful for that, Father, because it didn't look like she was going to make it. So we're trusting you, Father, and, and as we trust you, our faith. So, uh, Help us to understand your word tonight. Help Rob to make it as clear as a bell to us so that we can apply it to our lives in the power of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. He is the one and only uh, Amiti HaOlam, the light of the world this Hanukkah season. That's what we celebrate in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, yeah, and tonight uh, is the first night of Hanukkah, the festival oh, yeah. or the Feast of Lights. And uh, 
we uh, we hope and pray that you study um, uh, the uh, events uh, and the miracle of lights uh, that is surrounding Hanukkah. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful a wonderful uh, example of how God is faithful uh, to His people, the nation of Israel, and Israel, of course, being um, translated, not transliterated, but the word Israel means those who govern their lives or uh, 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 that are governed by God or those who wrestle with God. It means you're in a relationship with God. It's not a Gentile thing. It's, it is, uh, it's whether or not you have a relationship with God, then you are part of uh, the nation of Israel. So Circumcised heart. And Fran, who is the light of the yeah. world? Jesus. That's and, right. You know, we have a new Good Jesus job. girl with Mama. us tonight. Yeah, so if you're following along, we're in uh we're in First Corinthians chapter two, and we're going to uh cover the entire chapter, uh, which is 16 verses. And we know that Paul is dealing uh with this church. Uh it's a relatively new church, uh new believers in this church but they're strongly influenced by the culture. Rather than them following the word of God and influencing people in the culture, the culture has crept into the church and they are being influenced by the culture. And so they're having all kinds of problems. Uh, and it becomes clear that the reason for these problems is that, that the three years since Paul has left Corinth, uh, they, uh, the people of this church have forgotten the foundation, the foundational information that Paul taught them from the very beginning about Christianity, uh, the foundational doctrines uh, on which they were found. And at this point in history, this membership, are they're doing some really crazy things they're they're getting drunk during communion uh, they're known in fact in the community uh, for for sexual misconduct and sin there's they're they're suing one another they're dragging one another into the courts they're abusing their spiritual gifts the list just goes on and on and so as we get into chapter two, uh, where we will find the Apostle Paul reminding this congregation of uh, what this church ought to be about. Uh, and from time to time, you and I need to be reminded the foundational information that we learned at the beginning about Christianity. You remember that Corinth is about a 50-mile uh, walk uh, going west from the city of Athens. Uh, and we know that when we uh, study the book of Acts, which this would be a really good time to give a shameless plug for our uh, Monday night group um, that we're studying verse by verse in the book of Acts right now. But when you get uh, cover the history in the book of Acts in chapter 17, uh, we know that Paul was in Athens before he went to Corinth. Um, and we're, we're told that the, uh, the people of Athens were, uh, they were very full of themselves. They thought they were the master race. They thought they were the brightest and the smartest and the greatest humans, uh, ever made, so to speak. And they were so full of themselves. And when Paul was spending his time in the city of Athens, he would uh, keep himself busy in the community to engage in conversation, to get one-on-one -on -one discussions with other people, and then he would uh, turn the conversation around to uh, spiritual things. Um, and uh, one day he was uh, talking with a couple of philosophers, and uh, these philosophers became very intrigued with this Jewish rabbi by the name of, of uh, uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, and so these philosophers invited Paul to go to Mars Hill. Mars Hill. Now, 
that's not Mars Hill, North Carolina, uh, but rather <laughs> it's Mars Hill just right, right outside uh, uh, the city of Athens uh, to speak to a group of philosophers. And so, um, and Mars Hill was essentially like uh, the Supreme Court of philosophy at this time in history. And this is not, uh, this was not a, a, an event that was putting Paul on trial, but rather this was an event that was putting Christianity on trial. Uh, these philosophers were listening to what Paul was saying about Christianity and what the philosophers thought uh, was important enough that they should put this information into the catalog of philosophies. Now, what's interesting, uh, we'll talk a little bit about human nature. When you're in a room filled with philosophers, human nature would have us want to use uh, bigger words and deeper concepts and, and attempt to make ourselves look a little bit brighter and a little bit smarter than maybe we really are or a little bit more sophisticated uh, so that we can raise our level to that which we think the audience is at. Uh, so we attempt to speak more eloquently uh, because we're, he was in the midst of, of uh, philosophers. Uh, he didn't want to appear before this group as being inept or uh, uninformed. And so he, uh, he changed his presentation about Christianity and about the gospel. He, he used big words, he used deeper thoughts and meanings and so forth, uh, really attempting to impress these philosophers. Now, after this meeting, he leaves, and that is when he begins his march over to um, the city of Corinth, which is a a pretty long walk. It's a 50 mile walk. Uh, I get tired driving 50 miles, but this guy <laughs> walked 50 miles uh, towards Corinth. And during that walk, he begins to reflect on what just happened when he was in front of this group of philosophers. Uh, he recognized uh, that he became sophisticated in his message about Christianity. And during that 50 mile walk, he makes a conscious choice, a conscious decision that he was going to change his tactics on how he is presenting the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He decides to keep it simple. That, my friends, is the way the gospel was designed. He decides to go back to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ the way it was intended. So that gives you a little background now as to what we're getting ready to learn uh, as we jump into chapter two. Uh, Carrie Crawford, would you unmute and read verses uh, one and two, please? Nice and loud. Yes. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Christ and him crucified. So Paul is telling this Corinthian church, when I came to your town, so he's talking about way back, uh, you know, three years earlier, four and a half years earlier, he says, I did not come as the great philosopher nor did I come as a salesman. Uh, I was not attempting to impress anybody. Uh, I didn't use big words or deep concepts. We can see that Paul is looking back on his experience with those philosophers in Mars Hill and what he, what he did, uh, what, uh, what did he accomplish? I mean, after all, I mean, Athens is not known for their spiritual uh, people there. So he didn't accomplish very much by being sophisticated, right? And, uh, uh, and he decides, you can see he's going through this process. He decides to make it a simple um, a, a message about the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the way it was 
uh, intended that Jesus died for your sin. He was buried for three days. He rose on the third day. Uh, and, and, and so most of us remember that wonderful moment, that great moment in our life when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And uh, you remember where you were, you remember your emotions, you remember your thoughts. Uh, you know, you realize that you were a sinner and that you were on your way to hell and, and that you had this sin problem before a holy God. And in that moment, you didn't need anybody to be sophisticated, right? Uh, you didn't need anybody to become relevant to uh, to our culture. Uh, you didn't need any anyone to do anything fancy, use big words or deep concepts. All that you needed on that day was that somebody reached out to speak to you. They cared enough about you, and they wanted to tell you the basic and simple message that Jesus died. Uh, because you have uh, to, to pay for the sin problem that you have before a holy God. You didn't need smoke and mirrors up on the pulpit. You didn't need an award-winning uh, uh, praise and worship band. All you needed was the simplicity of the gospel, that Jesus died to pay the price for your sin. He was buried for three days. He rose again. And you just needed to hear the very simple truth. You needed to hear what was the solution to your sin problem. And all we got in our life, uh, we all have got people uh, in our lives today. They, they could be friends, they could be neighbors, they could be uh, relatives, they could be uh, associates at work. We all know we have people like that that we're praying for in our lives, that we're concerned about, and we want to bring them, lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And we think, well, how do I broach this subject with this person that's close to me? Now, how can I somehow impress them uh, and lead them to salvation? And so Paul Paul rolled, rolled into town and he decided to do one thing. He was going to share Jesus Christ. That's it. He did not attempt to impress anybody. He did not attempt to show how smart he was. He did not attempt to bring any attention or glory to himself. But rather, when, when people walked away from their conversation with Paul, they knew about the finished work of Jesus Christ. So that's what he's talking about here. All right, Joyce DeWall, would you unmute and read verses three and four? And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power. So Corinth, Corinth was a very nasty place very scary place. Uh, we remember that Paul was scared to death uh, when he was there. That word trembling that uh, Joyce just read, it literally means that Paul was shaking in his Hirachi sandals, right? He, he, he looked around the city. Uh, he said, this is, this is a God forsaken place. It's an awful place. I want to get out of here. But we know that God spoke to him and said, no, you're going to stay for a while. Notice he says, this is a very simple message. And it's, it's being communicated in a very simple way. And why has God designed the message of the gospel to be so simple? Why is this message to be shared by simple people? Well, the reason is so that when lives are changed, it's not because of some sophisticated person, it's not because of trickery, but, but rather it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit, which is behind the word of God. 
Now, when you think about how uh, your life has been changed, some of uh, some of you have changed uh, dramatically. You know where you are. You know who you are, aren't you? Right. <laughs> some of you have changed dramatically, right? And 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 think about how those changes actually took place. Was it because uh, of of some super cool, ultra, uh, you know? a uh, super intelligent person sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you, or did somebody simply share the simple message of Jesus that he lived, he died, and he rose again from the dead? And if you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, that God is going to save you from the wrath that is to come, and he will put his spirit, his Holy Spirit, in your heart, and he will begin to make that transformation in your life. That kind of change in someone uh, does not take place because of sophistication or because of intelligence of man. That's not how it happens, but rather the change takes place because of the presence of the Holy Spirit doing his work in your life. And so Paul is saying, hey, I decided that I'm going to deliver a very simple message. I'm going to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to let God be the one through the agency of the Holy Spirit to change people's lives and to change people's hearts. All right, um, uh, Roger uh, Hershey, I'm you. Would you read verse five, please? I'm having trouble. Oh, there. I did this so that you might, might trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. All right. So after we have been after we've been saved for a period of time, after we've had a few church services under our belt, after we have had a few Bible studies under our belt, all of a sudden, that simple message of the gospel for some reason, does not become quite good enough for you to use any longer. Our human nature begins to tell us that we need to embellish this message. We need to add something fancy to this message because we need to impress other people. And we tend to forget that it was the very simplicity of the message of the gospel that captured our, our hearts. Uh, the very thing that moved you and me to change our life, that simple message, our human nature has us think that we need to dress it up, we need to make it more fancy, and then you wonder why your life is not influencing non-believers to become a, a believer in faith, have faith in Jesus Christ. We need to remember that when somebody originally took an interest in you and took the risk to share the message of Jesus with you, your life was changed. And now when it comes to you sharing with other people, our human nature oftentimes just steps in the way and makes us think that we have to get fancy. You know, we have to put on that dog and pony show. Uh, uh, we, we, we need to spruce it up and make things relevant for the 21st century. And you know something? That's not what the Bible teaches. That's an absolute lie from the pit. The devil makes us think that. And that is not what the Bible teaches. If you want to be a witness for the kingdom of God, all you need to do is yield to the Holy Spirit and use the power of God and just share the very simple gospel message. And that is what changes people's hearts. And so Paul is saying, you know, back there in Mars Hill over there in Athens, I got fancy and I'm not gonna do that anymore. You guys are getting the simple message that Jesus lived, Jesus died and he rose again. And, and if you will believe that 
in your heart and confess that with your mouth, you will be saved. That is what it's all about. Okay, Arn, would you read verses six, seven, and eight, please? We speak wisdom, however, among them that are full, full grown, yet a wisdom not of this world, nor of the rulers of this world who are coming to naught. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, even the wisdom that hath been hidden, which God foredrained before the world unto our glory, which, which none of the rulers of this world hath known. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but as it is written. You now there is an exchange which takes place when each of us got gets saved. Prior to salvation, you and I were living uh, according to the wisdom of culture or the wisdom of the world. Notice he says the wisdom of the world is what? It is foolish. <laughs> and what is the wisdom of the world? Well, it's very simple. The wisdom of the world is, hey, let's make money and let's be happy. Let's have some fun. Paul is saying that is foolishness because when when it comes to that fork, when you get to that fork in the road, you make money and have fun or you be made right with God. If you decide to be made right with God, all of a sudden, God is going to give you wisdom. God is going to give you insight. And all of a sudden, you realize that life is no longer just about making money and having fun. Also, we must realize that uh, there is something big that is going on in our life. Uh, that we have, you know, we have a stage here in this world called the earth. That stage really, you know, it's, it's not real. Uh, we're told that at the end of the age, everything that you and I hear, everything that you and I see, everything that we touch, every experience, everything in this universe is going to be melted away with a fervent heat. That's what the Bible teaches. Therefore, what manner of man ought to be, ought we be? Uh, we, we, uh, what kind of a person and what kind of a lifestyle should we choose to be living? And what the Bible is telling us, each of us has a certain number of years here on earth, that is our stage. And God is preparing you for something that is much larger, something much bigger, something that is eternal. And it's all about eternity. And it's all about having a better resurrection. It's all about living with my creator for eternity. Now, the stage we live in here on earth, it's like going to school. It's a dry run, it's a dress rehearsal. And we're being prepared for something that's much larger. And if I fall into that trap of having a philosophy according to the world or a philosophy according to our culture, if my life becomes all about making money and having fun, I am failing everything which God has intended uh, for me to prepare. Uh, and in the coming ages, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's going to be a problem. You know, we have, it's very interesting in modern times, we have physicists who are now saying that our lives are similar. They're like a hologram. Uh, it's all based upon vibration. And you go back into Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, and what does it say? It says, God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. The vibration of God's voice brought all of these things into existence. Isn't it interesting that physicists, as smart as they are, are finally catching on with Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, that the day will come when God is going to fold this entire universe up 
And we're going to then step off into the eternal realm. And your position in the eternity is going to be based upon how well you worked on this stage in this lifetime. This is a test. Everything that we experience in our life is a test. Everything okay. is. Every request that comes your way, every illness that comes your way, every challenge that comes your way is a test. It's all a test where God is preparing you and he's preparing me for the age to come, that eternal age. And if it's pouring all uh, that we have into uh, a self-centered, self-righteous kind of life where all it's all about making money and having fun, we are ruining the plant which God has created for you and me all throughout eternity. And so Paul is telling the Corinthian church, you do not want to take this foolishness of exchanging the wisdom of God uh, 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 and, and, and following the wisdom of the world. You do not want to follow the wisdom of our culture. You do not want to follow the wisdom of our world, but rather, you want to follow the wisdom of God. And remember in John 1, 1, the word was with God and the word was God. So all of the wisdom that you require to be successful in this stage, this test that we have to prepare us for eternity, is right in the word of God. All right. The first eight verses, we're going to take a little break here. The first eight verses, any takeaways, any comments, any questions? Uh, uh, any epiphanies? Uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, with Grandpa Arnie. Go ahead. Okay. You know, in, in the first verse, they're talking about the testimony of God. And what he's saying is, hey, guys, this is in my word. The Holy Spirit has given me the testimony of God. And I think that, it, it, like in verse 2, his only purpose in this missive his only purpose is to identify the Messiah and what happened to him, you know, how he was crucified. I mean, the prophets, the book of Psalms, and the Torah all speak of the suffering of the Messiah. Yet some Jews still don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. A, th a thousand years ago, a rabbi named Moses Maimonides that if there is someone who arises that does does what miracles and things that a messiah should do he would be a candidate to be a messiah but if he dies he is not the messiah and that's why i think many jews don't believe jesus was the messiah is because he died uh, it, it was only after that thousand years it was only a hundred or several hundred years later that the Jews started to explore other explanations. But still, a lot of them believe in what Moses Maimonides had said. Yes, uh, the correct pronunciation is Maimonides. Thank you for that. Maimonides was uh, probably the premier uh, rabbinic uh, teacher uh, for all of the ages. In fact, his interpretations and his writings became the beginning of the collection of the Talmud and the uh, Mishnah, which are a collection of writings of interpretations of the law. Uh, and there are volumes and volumes of books. And, and for the, the, the many years that I was a leader in the Jewish community and the synagogue during the rabbi's uh, sermons, Maimonides was often quoted. But, you know, you bring up an interesting and a good point, uh, Arne, is that uh, Maimonides is correct, but but you you and I and all the people that are, are here tonight or all of the people in the future that are watching that are believers, that are watching on YouTube this recording, we have a responsibility. We have an obligation and a responsibility, God, to to lead people, especially the Jewish people, to read scripture. Now, you made two references here. One reference um, uh, 
uh, talks about the suffering servant. You can go right to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, there, you know, you can go to Jeremiah chapter 31. There's, I mean, in every book of the Old Testament, you can see, uh, um, you can see it pointing towards Yeshua Jesus as the Messiah, the promised Messiah. But uh, in addition to that, your second reference is the fact that Maimonides said that that if someone dies, they're not they're not the Messiah. But we have a, a responsibility to point people to the Gospels and to the Book of Acts, and we need to show them the Scripture, where there wasn't just one or two that said they saw what they thought they saw was a risen uh, Jesus from the grave. That's that's not what the the Gospels say. There were sufficient numbers hundreds, thousands of people who experienced. In fact, it was during a 40-day period, and in Jewish numerology, you've got the number 40 is a number of time of testing, a time of trial, and Jesus was testing uh, his followers' faith during that 40 days, the first 40 days of the 50-day count to uh, the counting of the Omer, which is which is the Feast of uh of, of uh, Pentecost, when uh, the delivering of the Holy Spirit took place. Jesus was there for the first 40 days after he rose from the grave, and then he ascended, and, and there were hundreds and thousands of 5, people, thousand people saw it. that witnessed this, that it was written about in, in, in the history books. And we have a responsibility and an obligation to point those Jewish people and the Gentiles, any non-believers, to the truth of the written word of God uh, uh, so that they can see that the death was a propitiation, a prepayment of sin for all people who are sinful in nature, but then he rose again. And and we have that obligation. We need to point that out. Thank you, Arne. Who else has a comment or a question or a takeaway? Uh, Carrie Crawford, unmute yourself and speak up. I just wanted to say, um, it says, don't be caught up in the wisdom of the world, but in the power of God. But in another verse, it goes even further to say that it's not by even might, it's not even by power, but by the spirit. So as we talk to people about bringing them to Christ, it is they are led by the spirit it's not about doing no matter if we talk fancy if we talk simply the movement is in the spirit that brings them to be drawn to him so i just want to say that thank you carrie we appreciate it. uh sylvia's going to build on that and we'll call on charles with a comment okay um you were talking about the wisdom of culture it's the wisdom of our culture. It's so smart. It's, it has resulted in 60 million aborted babies. So that represents half of all 30 year olds are not living in this country now. They're dead. They didn't get a chance at life. Half of the 30 year olds. Yeah. If you, that God intended to be living today are dead. Yeah, if you uh, go back to last week's lesson and watch the video, we talked about what man's wisdom is all about, and we quoted the abortions, we we quoted the wars, the bombings, all the improprieties and the dishonorable behavior that goes on because of man's wisdom, and that is not what we are to follow, but rather we are to follow the wisdom of the written word of God. Yes, and before salvation, we chose poorly. Remember that old movie, we chose poorly. Yeah. We followed the wisdom of the world, which is foolishness, God knows, foolishness. But once saved, God gives us wisdom liberally as we seek his word. His word is wisdom, it's truth. And uh, and it, turn, it represents eternal life for us. We chose wisely. We choose wisely now. Now this life is just kind of a 
kind of a preparation for eternity. This is just to see who will believe and who will mm -hmm. be spending eternity in, uh, in fellowship with the Lord. So we need to prioritize our, our relationship with the Lord. We are going to be facing him someday. We have to be careful about what we have to be making, uh, <laughs> explaining when we stand before the Lord, okay? Because he sees it all anyway, but we are going to be called to account someday. He wants us to live the best life we can live and the most fulfilling uh, life of satisfaction and peace and abundance. And we don't. Uh, we don't need to pursue all those things that uh, the culture tells us uh, is so attractive. You know, we're one poor decision away from becoming foolish. And we talk about this every week that, you know, we're fortunate. The unsaved don't have an option. They're just foolish, you see. But we're fortunate because we have a choice to make moment by moment decision by decision that when you come to a crossroad you have to make a choice or a decision all you have to do is take a breath and ask god how do you want me to behave here what attitude do you want you can choose to follow your your flesh your human nature which is likely going to be a poor choice or you can yield to the holy spirit we have a choice you see and we still can choose to be foolish but thankfully, we have a choice. And if you yeah. stop for a moment and just yield to the Holy Spirit, say, what attitude do you want me to have, Lord? What decision do you want me to make? How do you want me to handle this? Uh, God will speak to you instantly and let you know. Go ahead, Charles. Wow. I um, have a saying. I say the system is set up for us to fail, but most people don't realize it until it's too late. And reading the passage it just kind of jumped out at me because hidden in plain sight is the truth. And, and uh, your faith in understanding what Christ is in your life and to understand that it's so, it's so simple. <laughs> do you, do you, you're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. Mm -hmm. And the choices that you, you determine your own destiny. So uh, that's real. I got it. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of churches, Charles, that, uh, and, and not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's just not necessary. You know, I've been in churches. Sylvia and I have been in churches where they have these magnificent lighting, uh, you know, and, and smoke machine that that blasts their smoke music, uh, you know? when, they're, when they're playing their praise and worship music. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's not necessary. Uh, you don't need to have expensive and sophisticated things in order to share the good news of Jesus Christ. All you need is the simple message. And if you don't know what to say, you don't know how to say, just write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Just read it to somebody. And now you're in the middle of being a good witness to someone, opening up the possibilities of salvation for that person. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses one through four uh and we will get to that eventually as we get through this uh this book any other comments any other questions or takeaways roger hershey is next unmute yourself and uh, uh we'll call on you next i'd like to point out that uh, paul came back to the corinthians to uh, as a follow-up and it's uh, very important if you lead someone to christ to not abandon them and that it's important to uh, see that they grow spiritually and to follow up in their lives. So many people are so thrilled when I, I've led someone to Christ and they're and they're they're real thrilled about it and never see him again. And, uh, and the scripture tells that such a person abandoned is worse off than if they never found Christ in the first place. You know, Roger, it's a great, a great commentary. Thank you for that. And, and you know, you need to take this to heart. You know, there, you, you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19, and it says that man should not be alone. That is why God gave Eve to Adam. That's the first reference to fellowship in the Bible. And what Roger is saying here is that when you lead a person, 
or anybody is led that you know of to a saving knowledge. You need, you have a responsibility, you have an obligation to fellowship. That person needs to fellowship on a regular basis. That's why this, this group here and our Monday night group is so important to fellowship, mm -hmm. to continue to talk about the word of God. This is where we get unconditional love. This is where we get unconditional encouragement. encouragement. This is where we get corrective measures uh, that are respectful and loving in nature to help us grow iron sharpens iron. And mm -hmm. this is where we get prayers uh, and prayer requests answered right. and and you cannot get that in the culture so if you lead somebody to jesus saving knowledge and then you don't follow up with them and they get out back into the culture and don't get this kind of support of unconditional love and of unconditional encouragement and corrective measures to keep them on track you're putting them in a very dangerous and precarious position, and and you can't do that. Good job, Roger. Arn, you're next, brother. Yeah, I got. I just have. Uh, I wrote notes on three of the uh, uh, verses, five, seven, and nine. Starting with five, God's power is His wisdom, and His wisdom is defined for us in Scripture, and through faith. The power of God has only two purposes, one to defeat the enemy of God, and then the other to fulfill or build up the purpose of God. That was on verse five. On verse seven, the mystery, the mystery is that, that they didn't understand is the suffering, crucifixion, and crucifixion of the Messiah as foretold in scripture that we may be redeemed and sins forgiven. People had thought that was foolish. And in, then, in verse number nine, where it says, for it is written, the New Testament is important because the crucifixion and the resurrection, if it wasn't for that, this would all be for naught. But the Old Testament is also the word of God and must not be forgotten or thrown away. Amen. That's right. Amen. And while we're on the topic of mysteries, mysteries you might just want to jot down the very last verse in deuteronomy chapter 29 it's very easy to remember deuteronomy 29 verse verse 29 and it talks about the secrets in the bible and and what god is speaking of is this there are layers upon layers of depth and uh in 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 every verse there's literal meanings, there's spiritual meanings, there's figurative meanings, and God will not reveal the deeper ideas behind his scriptures until you are ready to receive it. Now, how do you get ready to receive it? It's you, you come to Bible studies, you read the Bible, you talk about scripture, that you have interaction. Uh, and, and as you do that and pray uh, and you go back and read the verse that you read last year, all of a sudden you see something new and different. That's because you've grown a little bit of uh, in spiritual maturity. So God now releases a little bit more depth of perception, if you will, to that particular verse. And so if, if, if you don't understand everything that we teach or that you read in the Bible, just be patient, keep reading, keep studying, keep discussing the scriptures, keep attending Bible study classes. And, and as you continue to grow and mature, according to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, God will reveal those things to you as you become spiritually mature enough to receive the, the deeper meaning in that verse. All right, any others before we move on? Sylvia's got another one, and then we're going to move on to verse 9. You, okay. have remember, you have to remember to read all these verses a couple of times, Rob. Like you said, that's how I found out that the Honda was invented so many thousands of years ago. A Honda. Gotcha. We were all in accord. Right. All in accord. They were all in accord. Yeah. Well, you know, I... <laughs> 
I kind of, it struck me uh, about the part about uh, Athens, Mars Hill. Uh, philosophers were putting Christianity on trial to see if it was worthy of being included in the human philosophical books. Uh, so they were they were uh, trying Christianity, not Paul. So just as when we witness adversaries have a problem not with us but with Jesus Christ, so we don't need to be shy about witnessing because if someone is adversarial about it. Uh, it's their own sin that is convicting them. The Holy Spirit is convicting them that they should not be living this sinful life that they're in, that they need to seek the Lord and draw close to him. You know, and, and we shouldn't be concerned if someone rejects uh, the gospel because they're trying, they're rejecting Jesus Christ because their sins convict them. They're not rejecting us personally. And I told Rob when he first uh, got saved, uh, he hesitated to share and witness with those who were unsaved because he was concerned he would have to close the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the way it works. And well, yeah, when you take away the fact that you don't need to close the deal, you turn that over to the Holy Spirit, it becomes a lot easier to talk about your faith. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so the Holy Spirit can and will work in any situation. The real key, I think, is to pray to the Holy Spirit before you witness to anyone and say, not my will, but thine be done. You know, yours be done. Because I've had instances where the Holy Spirit gave me exactly the right words to say, and I know it didn't come out. It came out of my mouth, but not out of my brain. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. like... like I've told you some stories like that about some some what incidents that happened in my life. For instance, my mom, my mom said uh, that my dad was dying, and why did I send my dad books on healing? And and the Holy Spirit said through me, "Well, mom, there's more than one way to get healed." You know, and he died shortly thereafter, but he was saved. He was saved as a result. So um, I don't know how I got off. Track, but I was going to say the good news, the gospel of Jesus is so simple uh, because if the Lord wants to reach the little children, you know, when a child comes of age at about age four, uh, they can make their own decision about Jesus. It's such a simple gospel they are able to receive. And so, so we don't need to uh, change the gospel to make it culturally relevant to the 21st century or to seem more sophisticated, uh, you, don't, you don't have to gild the lily, okay? <laughs> All right, good job. Yeah, the gospel is a very, very simple message. It was designed that way. And when you start to complicate things or embellish things, you're only bringing uh, confusion uh, and, and you don't need to do that. Jesus, has created a very simple message, and we are to keep it simple. All right, uh, Renee Stratton, would you read verses 9, 10, and 11, please, nice and loud? Okay, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Yeah, and some of your Bibles might say no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You cannot know another human being unless that other human being is uh offering uh disclosure uh is will as a willing participant in that uh in that in that relationship you know how many times have you experienced in your life where you attempt to really get to know somebody you attempt to be their friend you attempt to warm up with them uh, or to them, 
Uh, but they close the door. They pull away, they put a wall around themselves, they're cold, they're just not open to a friendship with you. And if, and if you don't want uh, us to know you, uh, there isn't anything that we can do if you don't open up uh, mm -hmm. to that. Now, the same thing is true with God. If you're going to know God, you must allow us uh to to um you must allow us to know him uh that is done through the agency i don't think i said that right no, he, god, he, he god must allow us to yeah. to know him and that is done mm -hmm. through the agency of the holy spirit mm -hmm. uh, do you remember what it was like let's say if you picked up a Bible before you committed your life to Jesus, before you were saved, you picked up the Bible maybe and read a few verses, and did it not seem to have not much sense? I mean, it just didn't make much sense to you. It seemed like nonsense. And isn't it amazing that right after you accept the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit takes up residency in your heart. You begin to read the Bible, and all of a sudden you get a, a sense of understanding God's Word. It began to make sense, not because you went to seminary, not because you went to Bible school, uh, but rather it's because the Holy Spirit takes up residency and reveals things to you, the Holy Spirit illuminates your heart and reveals to you the truth of God. That's how you build a relationship with uh, God. Uh, Charles, would you uh, read verses 12 and 13, please? Now we received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might kindly, we might know the things that have been kindly uh, given to us by God. These things we also speak, not with words taught by human wisdom, but with the taught, but those taught by the Spirit, as we combine spiritual matters uh, with spiritual words. Thank you. And some of your Bibles might say, so that we may understand that we that what has been freely given to us by God. You might want to just accentuate that word freely, underline it, highlight it, whatever. Notice the exchange that's taking place here. I was living my life guided by making money and having fun, and then all of a sudden I realized that there's something bigger going on in my life, and what, what I was involved with before my philosophy of life has been guided by the culture, by the world, and that was just insanity. Uh, and I'm not, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to follow that kind of insanity. The philosophy of life uh, that I now hold on to is having a life according to the written word of God, biblical principles. If you don't think insanity is defined by you living your life according to the philosophy of our culture. If you don't think that's crazy, to live your life according to the culture, you just need to think about our culture during the lifetime of all of those who are here in this call tonight. Most of us have been were born between the 1930s and the 1960s on this call. I think we have one that was born later, right? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and what, yeah, and, and, and what have what have we personally? Oh, maybe 1929. Okay, did I say that right? Uh, and and uh, uh, what is it that we have personally witnessed? The people on this call tonight. Yeah, what have what we, is it, Howard? <laughs> what have we personally <laughs> witnessed? in our lifetime about the culture that we live in? How many wars have we personally seen? 
How many bombings have we seen? How many elections filled with fraud have we seen? And for what? For what? So that government can rule and control us even more and make money off the backs of us? How many viruses have been intentionally let out of the bag to spread murder throughout the world? How many riots have we experienced where people are being killed and storefronts are being smashed in and, and, and products are being stolen? Is this not insanity that we have witnessed? Governments dropping bombs on other governments mm -hmm. under the guise of, clear, of clearing out the oppression that exists in that regime, yet the same governments are doing business with the likes of Saudi Arabia and justifying that it's okay because why? Well, we're making money and we're all having a lot of fun. You know, this is insanity. It's insanity, the stuff we have experienced in just our, the lives of the people here, it's insanity. And, and Paul is telling us that God is going to bring the same, uh, a sane, S-A-N-E, sane mind to the craziest person who is among us. We're not gonna vote on that tonight, but God is going to, <laughs> to bring sanity to the craziest person who is among us tonight, and if if they will just submit their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, his spirit will take up residency in, his, in, in your heart and will reveal to us the person and the work of God and everything that God has in store for us. All right, uh, Howard. Would you like yep. to read tonight? I would. 14. Verse 14. Just that one? Yep. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can we know them, because they are spiritually disconcerned. Okay, so we all start out being natural human beings, <clears throat> natural man, natural woman, the physical man, the physical woman who is governed by culture, which is making money and having fun, the human nature controlled and influenced by our culture. Paul talks about how human nature battles with the spiritual man. We spoke of that earlier. When guided by human nature, we cannot see the foolishness that we are being influenced by through our culture, the foolishness of, of dedicating our lives to making money and having fun. The natural man cannot discern the same things as the spiritual man. Howard, continue, 15 and 16. But he that is spiritually judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged by no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Thank you. So those, those of us who are spiritually minded are able to discern things. Spiritually minded individual understands what this life is all about. And it's not about just making money and having fun, but rather it's about having a relationship with God, God who created us the God who presently is at work in our lives, the God who is preparing us for the eternal realm for the ages to come. Notice that he says that we discern, we discern. Um, the spiritual person discerns, we know that if, we go down a certain path that bad things will result. 
And so we discern and make a decision that we're not going to go down that path. We're gonna take a different path. But the person who is discerning, those of us who are discerning because we're spiritual, we're going to have judgment by our friends and by our family who are not believers. Our unbelieving family, our unbelieving neighbors, our unbelieving co-workers, our unbelieving friends and family, they look at us who are discerning, uh, those of us who are spiritual, and likely they're thinking we're a bunch of morons. They think that we're wasting our time because they are the natural man or the natural woman, and they are not spiritually discerned. They cannot see why or what we we live our lives this way. There are really, you know, there's really two groups of people uh, who truly understand what life is all about. And the first group would be people like us who are believers, we're spiritual and discerning people. That's the first group. You know who the second group is that really know what life is all about? It's that man or woman that's laying on their deathbed. If you've ever been in the presence of a person who is on their deathbed, you're going to notice that a, a revelation comes on them and you'll notice they don't speak about making money. They don't speak about having a fun life. What do they speak about? You'll hear things, you don't hear them say, well, gee, I really wish I bought that Mercedes Benz instead of the Ford. You don't hear them say things like, like uh, I wish I purchased the 4,500 square foot house instead of the 2,500 square foot house. That's not what they're talking about when they're on their deathbed. They're gonna say things like, gee, I wish I was a better dad. I wish I read more books to my grandchildren. I wish I went on more mission trips. I wish I was a better husband or a better wife. But now for that person lying on a deathbed, it's too late. But for those of us who have invited the Holy Spirit to come and indwell us, live inside of us, we have plenty of time. We have time to make adjustments in our lives. Not all about making money and having fun. You can make a choice to change all of that because you understand the importance of living a spiritual life rather than living a cultural life. Remember that we're going to have pushback by non-believers. There are going to be people in our lives that don't believe and they're going to think we're crazy. They're going to think we're misguided. They will not understand why it is that we live this way. Uh, um, you know, they'll, they'll think a spiritual person, uh, because we have insight and because we know what's important, uh, and because we know what's unimportant, there's going to be a lot of pushback in a lot. But we have to just be focused and determined on what kind of activities that we need to be involved with. What kinds of things could we be doing with the resources that God has gifted us with? What do we do to benefit the kingdom and to praise and worship our creator? How do I break down my time? How do I spend money and the resources God has given me to benefit the kingdom? And if you don't know, just ask God. Ask God to give you give you a message on what to do with your time, what to do with your money, what to do with your resources. And then through the agency of the Holy Spirit, God is going to lead you and guide you by using the Holy Spirit. You will uh, you'll you'll be doing mighty things in mighty ways for the kingdom of God. So Understand that the gospel 
the message of, of Jesus Christ is to be simple, designed that way. It doesn't have to be embellished. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's very simple. Jesus, Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again three days later. And all we have to do is, is to share that message and to do the things that God asks us to do. And uh, we will have the promise as well to rise in that resurrection uh, in an eternal state and have fellowship with the Lord uh, forevermore. Amen. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about uh, the rest of the verses. What kind of takeaways, what kind of epiphanies or uh, uh, questions might you have about any of these uh, verses? Uh, Sylvia's first. Okay. It struck me that before salvation, the Bible is was incomprehensible. Mm. I mean, totally. I mean, do you recall reading the Bible before you were saved? It seemed like gibberish to me. However, after I received the Holy Spirit and had his advice as the helper in my life, paracleto in the Greek, Come alongside to help like a wife <laughs> uh, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth and illuminates our hearts and the Holy Spirit explains spiritual matters to us uh, to our spirit and uh, the, the natural man cannot discern God or his or the matters spiritual matters and um, and his truth. And the believer has the mind of Christ. Now that is a pretty powerful uh, and uh, awesome uh, thing to, to wield, okay? Like, um, like Franklin Graham Jr. said uh, that prayer is an awesome weapon that we wield against against uh, Satan, but I mean, it's the same kind of thing. We have a, a, an incredible, precious power in the mind of Christ as believers, being able to disper di discern spiritual things. What a great resource to be able to have the mind of Christ. Mm. Mm. Awesome. And 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 the way to expand that mind of Christ is to do exactly what you do tonight, what you do on Monday nights. And I'm sure I know well, many of you uh, attend many other Bible study classes every week uh, or listening to sermons online or Bible studies online. It, it, that is how if you study the word of God, that's what he left behind for us to get to know him. Arn, you're next, brother. All right, I can't hear I found you. found something fascinating tonight. Oh, yeah. oh, good. I said I found something fascinating. The fascinating thing I found is verse 10, okay, where it says, the spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. There's another example of the Trinity, where you have the spirit searching the deep things of God, and we have the mind of Christ. I find this oh, fascinating. interesting. Very interesting. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, in fact, uh, the Trinity, uh, the, the whole concept of Trinity for people who do, do not have discernment, it's hard for them to understand, but there are examples of it all throughout the Bible. Was that, you said that was verse 10? Yeah. Verse 10 talks of the Spirit and how the Spirit is able to search all things of God. And then the last verse says, and we have the mind of Christ. Yeah. Um, Pretty amazing. Yeah, so uh, interesting, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of examples of it going all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, 2, and 3. Actually, in Genesis 1, 1, there's an example of the Trinity. That would be a, a fascinating study for uh, for us to do sometime on is where the Trinity is uh, is 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 uh, revealed 
uh, in all throughout the Bible. And starting so, with Genesis. Yeah, yeah, Genesis one. one one. <laughs> all right, who else has a comment? Thank you for that, Arn. Comment, question, takeaway, and remember that. Um, Grateful to have over 50,500 views on my YouTube channel. And those things that you say on these recorded Bible studies could be the one very special thing that somebody watching needed to hear in order to plant the seed for salvation. Yeah. And so don't hold back. If you have something to share about these verses, it could be the very one thing that could provide salvation to somebody. Sylvia, go ahead. Well, I like the part about the two groups of people who knows what life is really all about. Uh, believers with the Holy Spirit and those who are on their deathbed. I think that shows the grace of God. Uh, the grace of God reaches out. He is unwilling. For any to perish. You know, uh, Sylvia mentioned this earlier that her dad found salvation on, on his, his deathbed, deathbed uh, because Sylvia sent him some uh, cassettes, cassettes back in uh, from um, uh, John John Hagee, uh, who is just a real dynamic uh, preacher, and uh, it was about her, her dad. Uh, had a lot of time on his hands when he was on his deathbed and uh, God was gracious to him. Uh, so people who are on their deathbed do have an epiphany. They do have a change. They have a revelation. Um, and, 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 and that's the time where often you see the pride just peel away. And the veil. The honesty, <laughs> where the honesty steps in uh mostly honesty with yourself and uh and 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 all of a sudden making money and having fun is no longer uh intriguing it's no longer important but the real things of life become important that's right yeah. we understand the importance of a spiritual life and so do those who are going on to be uh to meet the lord um and that should be our priority. Uh, what then shall we do to benefit the kingdom? What is God asking us to do to benefit his kingdom? This is what we should be considering, what we should be consulting with the Holy Spirit. Lord, what's the next right and righteous thing that you would have me to do? Yeah, and, and, and that, that mission is never done. That's right. I mean, we have our it. precious friend Fran on the call tonight yes. who just yeah. got out of the hospital. And what did she say on our last call on Monday night? Uh, she was talking about she doesn't think that the Lord is done with her mm -hmm. and she needs to find out or figure out or ask the Holy Spirit what needs to be done through her to That's continue right. to serve the Lord and the well, kingdom. She's praying, she's praying for nurses right now. <laughs> so, especially. I mean, your work is never done when you're working for the kingdom. That's There's no right. retirement when it comes to the work of the kingdom. And if you yeah. don't know what to do, you just need to go to the Lord in your quiet time, your prayer time, and just say, Lord, I'm going, I want to say yes. What is it you want me to do? You're my Lord. Use me. Use me. And just wait and you'll you'll see. You'll hear, you'll see. Something's gonna happen. He will show you what it is that he wants you to do. That's right. Who else has a comment, a question, a takeaway, a concern? I like verse 18. It says, If any let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, must become foolish so that he may become wise, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. Very nice. That's very nice. Good job, Fran. Oh, uh, I want to add to chapter three. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. 
can do it's okay. We'll, you we'll, can. we'll get there next week too. It'll yeah. be a nice review. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I do, uh, I do think when God um, takes away our breath and we can't breathe, we begin to think what is really important in life. And it, it causes you to think. Yes. And I'm trying to to continue that thinking process. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, we'll continue to pray for you and yeah. for Howard. You seem very much stronger. We're so encouraged by that. Because after all, you're our queen of encouragement, you know? Gary Crawford, <laughs> you had a comment? Gary? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I was just thinking about the mind of Christ. That's very valuable. I think it's in Ephesians, maybe. Um, it, that can be made into a prayer, which I do. Sometimes you get up and you just, on your right course, you say your prayers, everything is going well. Then all of a sudden things get chaotic. Something just gets you off your path. I just love that. And you can just say, let that mind be in me, which is in Christ Jesus, to help bring you back. I just really like that. I think it's in Ephesians is in Ephesians. And I just was thinking, I think I think when we were started on Acts and it, and I think it was Peter who, I think he brought up the two groups uh, or he talked about um, who, who are the two groups of those who, um, those who believe and you know, that can be broken down into what, what different, points a lot of people are and those who don't so which group do you want to find yourself in right the sheep or the goats you know what you're talking about with the, the stabilizing influence when life feels chaotic of the mind of christ uh the term in the greek is phreneo p-h-r-e-n-e-o uh, i believe and uh, it's a very calming and stabilizing uh, um, influence, and believers need to use that when they're feeling battered by the world. Okay, uh, and it, and it really is it it really is a wonderful, lovely thing, and especially if if folks have emotional issues or psychological issues, who and especially the saved ones, they will they will stabilize with you know leaning on the holy spirit and the freneo the 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 mind of christ yeah mrs any other comments takeaways questions well there's one other thing that struck me remember remember when it talks about the light of the world that was in the world before you know genesis 1 before God created the lights in the firmament, firmament i.e. the sun, the moon, and the stars, there was light. Well, who was that, Renee? Uh -huh. <laughs> who Jesus. was that? Was that Jesus? That's right. That's right. And, and there's an interesting thing that scientists have just discovered. It's elemental it's uh uh it is actually a it's smaller than a photon and it's the it's basically the glue of the universe that holds things together it's light it's an element of light called lignin oh it was lignin. laminin 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 and guess what it's shaped like it's in the shape of a it's cross. It's in the shape of a cross. It's what holds the cells <laughs> holds together the in cells our body. Together in our body, it holds indeed the whole universe together. Yeah. In fact, if Jesus let go, we'd all just we explode would just into blow it. off into the outer space. <laughs> um, I want to remind you as we get ready to close this uh, Bible study that next Thursday um, we will. Um, we will be broadcasting from uh, uh, Myrtle Beach yes. at our condo there. Uh, we'll be doing we uh, uh, First Corinthians chapter three. That was for you, Charles. First <laughs> Corinthians chapter three, 
uh, which are there will be 23 verses. And then this coming Monday, um, we'll, be there then, we'll, so be, yeah. Yeah, we'll be there by Monday at yes. 530. Got to get up early. Monday. Get up early. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to be covering Acts chapter 7, uh, which is 29 verses. So Monday, Acts chapter 7. Next Thursday, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we would hope and pray that uh, you all you are available and willing to attend um, invite others. and uh, be ready to contribute uh, commentary um, uh, as as you've seen uh, as it as it you deem it to be appropriate. Uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for your faithful attendance yes. in these Bible studies. Very your attendance is the very thing that encourages us to continue uh, to prepare lessons. And uh, and the fact that you attend and make your comments is what makes it very interesting. So we're grateful to I each and every one of you. I find it fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Arne, thanks for inviting your granddaughter. Yes. And let's con Caitlin, let's continue. <laughs> Continue to pray for it. her. Pray for hey, Kate. please continue to pray for Howard and Fran, and, Fran. and for all of the unspoken prayer requests uh, that we all have. Uh, just keep praying for one another because it's very mm -hmm. important. Um, okay, uh, Renee Stratton, would you bless <laughs> us with a uh, a prayer to close our uh, our our uh, study tonight? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us and everything that we have need of, you know, and you provide for us. Lord, I thank you for this message tonight, this Bible's teaching of your salvation being the gospel being so simple that we can really share so easily with those that are around us. Help us to listen to those who come across our path, that we hear their hearts cry, and that we can enter into that, their lives and share a better way for them. Father, I thank you for all these um, prayer requests that have come up, and I know that you know everyone, um, their needs, and for healing, and for um, everything they have need of lord i thank you for answering their prayers and lord um i just thank you that um we can all be together through this time and that the um COVID virus is is uh, on its way out there is a vaccine that's coming lord let it be um, whole for our bodies and not to damage it in any way in Jesus name. Thank you, Father. Bring this country together. Lord God, help us be merciful to us, Lord God. We just have so much need of you. And Lord, that is the only thing that's going to heal this land is Jesus Christ and him being crucified. I thank you for doing a mighty work in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Very nice.